Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our machine learning seminar. Today, we'll have a pleasure to have a talk from Professor David Wag, uh, who is a professor uh, of nonlinear dy dynamics at the University of Sheffield, and who will be supported, I guess, in the discussion at least, uh, by uh, Professor Nicolas de Vrilis. Um, the title of the presentation is already visible on the screen, so uh, not to lose any more time on my side. Uh, David, the virtual floor is yours. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, Jacob. Thank you. So, yeah, thanks for the introduction. Uh, just, just to mention, as Jacob says, that um, Nikos is here online and I, I asked Nikos to attend because I know that you're particularly interested in machine learning aspects of of the of the work um, and that's Nikos um, Nikos has uh, a considerable expertise in that area more than I do so it, when we get to the discussion um, and maybe also partly in this in this presentation Nikos will be able to help um, explain what we did and what our interests are in this in this kind of digital twin context just also to mention that Laura Edd Eddington who's the first author here is a PhD student and an Anis uh, Ben Abdel Salam, the other co-author, he's uh, an expert in the approximate Bayesian computation aspects. So he helped us with with, with that. Um, so the let me see if I can progress. Yeah, here we go. So uh, overview of the presentation. I'm going to obviously just give you a bit of background and try and set the scene a little bit so that you understand where we're coming from. And, and in particular, with digital twin, try and explain what what our meaning is when we when we say digital twin and then I'll go a little bit deeper into the theoretical model that we used and to create this time evolving digital twin uh, and then after that I'll show you an example app application which is which is a, um, a tank system where water can flow in between some tanks essentially so that's that's the kind of um, setup of what we are hopefully going to cover today so I'm, I'm sure most of you will, will have heard and, and know about digital twins. You know, it is a bit of a hot topic right now, and um, it's 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 gained a lot of attention. And and you know, there's 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 sort of different opinions. I think there's there's some skepticism, quite rightly, about you know a lot of a lot of big claims are being made and so on. And 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 it's an interesting area in that in in partly because of that, but also partly because in terms of the academic, uh, mathematical and sort of engineering side it's quite underdeveloped so you know one of the reasons i'm interested in it is that i see that there's an opportunity for the academic community to actually do some quite interesting work to to actually sort of start to build up the more the you know the more rigorous mathematical and and um numerical type foundations that that, that then could be used in a more robust way in in, in applications so you know i'll explain as you know what what our kind of um perspective is but one of the perspectives we have is 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 coming at it from a sort of asset management perspective and so in that context you know the types of advantages a digital twin might give you is to try and make our designs our manufacturing our testing and our maintenance you know more affordable more efficient more effective um and in particular um, the group in Sheffield are, are interested in health monitoring and using data uh, data and other models for health monitoring of structures and also making predictions about the remaining life and the remaining operational condition of structures. Also things like remote monitoring and of course engineers always want to try and reduce unforeseen failures. Okay, so that's another another area where digital twins might um, be a useful concept. Now, of course, the, the interesting thing or one of the interesting things about digital twins is that it's kind of riding on the back of this huge interest and, and development of AI and data science more broadly. And I think, of course, that's helped to accelerate, you know, interest and development of the concept. And from an engineering sort of pragmatic perspective, I think that that might have the advantage of, of helping us to obtain potentially more feasible implementations that are, you know, less expensive and, you know, maybe may more realistic in practice. But there's definitely a kind of interplay between the uh, the developments in maths and computer science and engineering and the digital twin, if you like, kind of from my perspective anyway, intersects those those fields and tries to take the, the, the best 
from the most recent results and research there. So coming more practically to what we mean by digital twin. So we're engineers, so we work with engineering assets. So here's a picture on the left of a, of a wind turbine. Um, this is something that's very close to Nikos's heart, and he can say more about the wind energy aspects maybe later. But um, Nikos and others work very closely with um, Siemens Gamesa, for example. And of course, renewable energy in, in the European um, energy market is a, is a kind of key um, developing sector. And all countries, you know, particularly recently, realised the importance of trying to, you know, uh, decarbonise our, our fuel product, uh, sorry, our energy supplies. And so wind energy has become an important, important sector. In this example, we've got a physical twin of a wind turbine and we, we're going to create a digital twin. And so a digital twin is essentially a virtual duplicate of, of the um, physical twin. So you can see a, a sort of image of it on the right hand side. And you'll see that there's a two way arrow system there we, and so that's showing that we are trying to interact both ways between the physical and digital twin so you can imagine that we'll have sensors on the physical twin and we'll be recording data streams and they're taking that data and then using it within the virtual duplicate within the digital twin to perform some analysis some modeling maybe some predictions and then those the results from those analyses will support decisions and operational uh, management processes as to how to operate and manage the actual asset, the, the, in this case, the wind turbine. Now, the, the digital twin idea, I think, is a very sort of versatile and, and universally understood concept. And I think there's a sort of link to sort of science fiction where people have seen films of virtual renditions of humans. And, they, and so, you know, when you talk to somebody about it, I think everybody kind of gets it. But of course, it then gets very difficult because, you know, a lot of people get hung up on the geometric representations and the visual representations. And if you look across the field of digital twins, for many people, that's what it means, right? You know, re replicate, uh, sort of replicating the geometry and making a visualization of it. But of course, as engineers, we want something more meaningful than that. We want to have some quantitative processes. We want to have all sorts of engineering um, kind of uh, analyses in the digital twin essentially a, a, you know potentially also a geometric representation as well but it, for us it's more than just geometry and if you're trying to build that thing in practice that that becomes challenging so again drilling down a little and a little bit more specifically in, in the in the framework that we're working with here we, we're thinking of um, sort of defining three sort of um, objectives the first one is to emulate the input output behavior of our physical twin and so if you if we're emulating, we don't care about the internal states. We're just trying to think about input output matching. Then we call simulation the next step. That's where we want to match the input output behavior. But we also care to some extent about the internal states. So we would also like to not only predict the input output, but also some of the physical in, uh, states within the system as well. And then finally, to make predictions, we want to do both emulation, simulation and potentially predict outside the regime of parameters and data that we, we that we have um uh we've created our digital twin with okay so this is a kind of a, a, a much more difficult um objective that we'd like to work towards so we what we're going to talk about today is mainly just the emulation now as, alongside that again you know being engineers and wanting to quantify you know the um the key um, behavior of the system we want to also take account of uncertainties because that's key of key importance to us and so we would we would like ideally to have um you know uh, some quantification of observation or measurement errors also model form errors or epistemic uncertainties you know the in the inadequacies of the models that we're using so we'd like to kind of try and capture that if we can we also want to take account of parameter uncertainties where that's appropriate and if if appropriate also numerical errors are sometimes separated out. Numerical errors actually in, in this work and in many other people's work is just going to be rolled into um, the kind of model form errors um, or, or one of the other one of, one of the other representations of uncertainty. So what do we do to start with? So to start with, we, we, we start with quantities of interest. OK, so the physical twin, there'll be some engineering imperative. You know, what, what are we trying to do into the asset management? OK, we, we're we're dynamics engineers in Sheffield primarily, so we look at vibration signals a lot. So we may take okay the uh, some acceleration signals from accelerometers on on the uh, on the structure, but there may be other signals, strain gauge signals, or, or whatever it is. 
But they either directly measure or we can infer from those um, some quantities of interest which are going to be key for our asset management processes. Okay, so we identify those quantities of interest and we're going to define them and put them into a vector Z and, and that's going to be our that what we're going to aim for. It could be one, it could be you know a whole vector of, of QOIs. Now I've implicitly kind of assumed, but I haven't really said yet that there's a time evolution. Okay, and for, for us the time evolution is very important. Often people sort of say, well, you know, what's the difference between a digital twin and a model? So one of the differences is that we're expecting the digital twin to evolve in time. OK, so time step by time step. OK, so that that would also then include our models and other processes in the digital twin. They have to be continually or at least periodically updated OK, to represent the time evolution. And we in the, in the model, we're going to represent that as as a series of time steps, which is up, which are I. And if we want to put that explicitly into into the time uh, time base, we have TI in some time interval from start to end when we're operating the digital twin. So what we want to do is ultimately we want to try and match an output from the digital twin to the quantities of interest. And we're going to do that with these um, this kind of expression here. So we've got, it's a bit like a control output where we've got the outputs Y, a vector of outputs, which are, are defined through these digital twin output functions eta. So there's a vector of functions here, but for each of the n q quantities of interest, we'll have a separate um, output function. And then within the output function, the digital twin is, is a function of a, a group of things, which I've got in that bracket there in equation one. So um, probably most importantly, the, the M represents a library of models. OK, so there's going to be a number of models inside there. And each each of the models is M. This, this MP is the piece model. Um, and the models can be physics based models or otherwise called white box or, or they can be data based like black box models or they can be hybrid models, some gray box models. Those are the three types that we're thinking of at the moment. Perhaps there are other types. Um, the, the capital D in, is, represents that there's there's a series of data sets that, that of course, are going to be continually adding added to as as more um, as the as the digital twin is evolving in time. And then the capital T in, is the sort of temporal set of information. That's the start time, end time and uh, time steps and so on. The chi. Um, vector or, or set would include um, all the hyperparameters we need for our and, and other parameters. For example, if we're doing optimization, which I'll, which I'll talk about a little bit later, they'll all be included there. And of course, the time um, uh, uh, parameter is, is important as well. OK, so that, the basic idea is we've got our quantities of interest. We've got the outputs from the digital twin, and we're going to try and quantitatively compare them, essentially, to compare the performance of the digital twin. So how are we going to do that and, and also capture the uncertainty? We're going to do it with a statistical model. And, and some of you might represent uh, recognize this comes from, this is applied in many, many other uh, applications. So for example, um, Kennedy and O'Hagan wrote a very well-known paper on um, Bayesian calibration. And those of you that are familiar with that might recognize that this is, this is a very similar type of statistical model from the one that they used. So the basic idea in this in, in this is that well, I've dropped the superscript. So in a lot of these, I'll, there's the, this is the nth quantity of interest, but in, that's represented by a superscript. I've just dropped that to make it a little bit clearer. So this is our quantity of interest that we can measure. And of course, you know, in, in the concept is that there's some real process here, which we can't really observe and some measurement error, some measurement noise. OK, so we, this is what's happening, but we can't really get access to that. So what we do is we try and represent that by an output function from a digital twin. So this is the nth, which I've dropped um, output function at time step i. And then we've got two other terms here, which this delta term represents the inadequacy of the model or the epistemic uncertainty. And this again is the measurement error. OK, so we so this is a bit like what Kennedy and O'Hagan did with a they were talking about computer models. So they had this as their computer model. Now what we've done is we've replaced that with the uh, with the complete digital twin, right? Which is a function of multiple models plus data sets plus other things. Okay, so that's that's basically the idea. Um, and Kennedy and Hagen, of course, went on and actually postulated models for the inadequacy and so on. We, we're not going to do that here, but that's that would be an obvious kind of extension. We're we're just going to do something a little bit more basic than that um, for for the time being. Um, and there's there's a little bit of information. Yeah, some some people roll these, uh, you know, combine these things together. But that's a kind of detail that we don't need to to worry about for now.
So if we, we can reorganize that equation if we want to um, and, and, and represent the combined uncertainty as, as the difference between what we measure and our digital twin output. OK, so this is a, this is kind of like a relatively crude measurement of the error for, for a, one of the one of the scalar QOIs. OK, so we can then. You know, one way forward is to, is to is to create an error metric. So that's what we did. And again, this is this is relatively simplistic. So um, there's 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 more there's more interesting and and sophisticated ways of taking this forward. But essentially, we kind of turned this into some kind of normalized mean square error. So this is as again, this is the QI measurement, and then we subtract off what we're predicting with the digital twin output function. Okay, we turn that into some um, error quantity. And again, this is this is choices, right? So depending on the exact details of what you want to try and achieve, you can choose different metrics or you can choose a slightly different metric depending on what your purpose is. But the concept is you choose a metric from your uh, based on your statistical model. And now we would need to start thinking about assembling this digital twin output function. OK, and, and the way we do it is we we build it up from model outputs. So we've got this library of models. And as I said before, they're, they're, they're physics or white box models black box models from our database models or gray box models, depending on what we've what we're doing. Um, we're going to just use physics and 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 numerical or black box models. And each of those models in turn. Mirrors the structure of having an output. So for the for the mpth model, we have an output function, which now is eta hat to the hat means model. And so you can see this should look a bit more familiar. So the model is has states. It has time uh, a time. Uh, variable, it has a parameter vector, u is the inputs, d is the data sets that are needed, and psi is the kind of hyperparameters that the model might need. Okay, so we have as many models as, as we want to um, include in our library, okay, and each of them has an output. Okay, and so what we're going to do is we, we, um, we're going to try and ensemble a weighted combination of those model outputs to create the digital twin output. OK, so now an important aspect, which I haven't mentioned up to now, is how are we going to do that in terms of a continually time evolving system? So what we're going to do is we're going to segment the data as it as it arrives or as we receive it. OK, so so the S here is is this S data segments and each data segment is, no, is denoted DS. OK, and so as we receive the data, we're going to segment it. And then we are going to introduce a series of weighting functions, which are row. OK, and then we're going to represent here now we're going to represent our quantity of interest as a combination, a weighted combination of the model outputs. So these are eaters with a hat on. These are that's the output of model one. This is the output of model two, and so on, all the way up to the nth model. Okay, and each of those is weighted by one of these row functions. Okay, and again we're into choices. Okay, so we want to think about what are we trying to achieve with our with our weighting. And that might go back to whether we want to emulate, simulate, or try and predict. Okay, so I'll try and say a little bit more about that later. For now, we we do we we just try to go for the simplest thing possible. Okay, so that was emulation, um, and that tended to favour the database models. You can see if we if we put all these uh, this weighted sum together, essentially it then becomes this it becomes this uh, digital twin output function e to i, and of course we still have to include the two uncertainty terms here as well to to uh, you know as part of our statistical model so it's important to note that what we're doing here is each of these models is trying to predict the same uh, qoi so it's a bit like for each data segment we test each, you know we apply each of the models that we're going to use in our weighted combination each of them tries to predict the quantity of interest then depending on the performance of each of those models we then weight them into our weighted combination so choosing the weighting values. So, so here we here we you know we're we're into sort of um, optimizations and 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 cost functions and so on. And again, where there's a lot of choices, and of course there's a huge variety of ensemble methods, uh, ensemble modeling methods out there already. Um, and again, what we did in our first in our first pass, we just try to take something very very simple just to kind of test the the hypothesis and and so on. So what we did was we just used is we we took the uh, normalized mean square error. And we created a weighted sum, and then we're trying to um, optimize, if you like. So, if you minimize the weighted sum in some sense, subject to the constraint that the weights, when they're added together, are equal one, okay, and that all of the weights are in the interval zero to one. 
So it's a really simple um, first approximation, and there are a lot more sophisticated things that could be done here, which are, which are perhaps some um, options for future work, future extensions of the idea. So moving on to the, um, the example. So, so this example is actually comes from a team of people. Um, well, it's been used many, many times, but the, they, the data that we got came from a team of people from Liège who had a physical version of this system. So the, the system consists of a reservoir at the base and a pump. The water is pumped up into the first, the top tank, tank one, and then it's allowed to flow into tank two. And then from tank two, it flows out and into back into the reservoir again. Okay, so it's a, it's a relatively simple engineering system, but it was useful to because there's some there's some data available that we could use and some and some models that we could use as well. The system can overflow. Okay, so the tank tank one can overflow into tank two and tank two then overflows into the reservoir, in which case the dynamics become much more complex. Okay, and, and I'll and I'll mention a bit about that as we as we look at this. So here, for example, this data, the data comes from this these these authors here. This is the reference. Um, and this this um, has been used. Um, some of you might have attended. There's a workshop in nonlinear system identification benchmarks that happens each year, and this this uh, has been used uh, for for that many times. And so this just shows one of the tank inputs that uh, that is, comes from that data set. So what we're going to use in in our example is. Um, some physics-based models and some database models, or one database model. So this is the model that that those authors put forward in their in their paper that they identified. Uh, and this is a physics-based model. It's a differential equation ODE model. You can see that it's nonlinear because it's got square roots in here of the states. So x1 and x2 are the states. They're the they're the they're the um, levels of the two tanks. Okay, x1 is the level of tank one. X2 is the level of, of tank two. So here's the here's the differential equation which defines the dynamics. There's some uh, um, noise terms, W1, W2, there's parameters, the Ks are parameters, the U is an input term. Okay, so we're interested in the output of tank two, so we define our output function for this model as X2. I'm missing a hat on that Y, so I apologize for that. Um, and we can put the parameters together in a parameter vector, and U obviously is the, is the input. The noise terms, I, I'll, I'll kind of skim over those. They, they're used as as and when necessary in the in the physical base model. Okay. Now another group of researchers then updated this model and and uh, to allow for the case of overflow. Okay, so this is the same model, but but um, it's been um, augmented or improved. So now there's a choice here on this um, x two dot line. You've got two choices, and that depends on whether the tank one is greater than 10 or less, which which corresponds to overflow. OK, so now there's an additional sort of physics um, implement. Uh, sorry, but part here with, you know, some people have gone away based on the identification that they've done. They've improved the model. OK, so our model library now has two models, M1 and M2. And M2, in theory, is better in uh, re uh, replicating the physics. So again, we take the tank two level as our output. And then we've got a slightly different parameter value um, vector here. Um, so as I mentioned, the, the way that we did the computation for these models was to use approximate Bayesian computation. Sometimes people ask, why did you do that? Because you know ABC seems like overkill for simple ODE models. And the answer is that um, we and we did it because in most digital twin applications, you don't have simple ODE models to work with. Okay, so most digital twins like the wind turbine. Uh, the you know there are there are there are more complicated models, and so in that case ABC is is a better choice, and it is something that we can that we can use quite pragmatically. Although it can be computationally intensive, okay. So so we used it there um, for that reason, but also because it's a nice way to capture the um, the parameters uncertainty. So the database model. So this was a uh, a NARC neural network model. Um, and you can see a, a representation of it there in um, equation 11. So we call this model M3. It's based on lagged versions of the system input and response. Um, there's a little bit more details here about the, um, the the structure of the of the neural network, and we perhaps can come back to that in the in the discussion. But essentially, we're using the data that we've got from that data set uh, from the guys in Liège. A little bit of detail here about how we segmented the data. Okay, so the 
there was actually only a relatively small amount of data so there's only 1024 points so and we segmented that into eight equal size segments of 128 points which is small okay so ideally in a digital twin situation we'd have much much more data but that was a constraint on us um, and so we worked with that to to um within the constraints of what we had essentially so going back to our how we would then apply our statistical and our theoretical framework that we developed uh, previously we've got we're going to have two models in our in our system one physics based model one database model so in this first case we've taken m2 which is the more sophisticated physics model and we've taken m3 which is the database model so here's what it looks like for tank 2 so tank 2 is is um n equals 2 because it's the second state and it's the second qoi okay so we've got two model outputs one for the physics based model one for the database model and we're going to choose two weighting functions here based on the the optimization criteria that we we've um, defined um, and that's going to give us our output function digital twin output function here okay so that digital twin output function is the weighted sum of the model output functions. Um, now, just as an aside, you know, the, another interpretation of this is that we've got a model library and that we're selecting some of those models depending on what our purpose is. If you wanted to, you could you could select, you know, you could have a weighted combination of all the models in the library, or you could use your your optimization process is more like a choosing process so you could use it to choose the best single model or the best combination of physics and database model so again this comes back to what your purpose is with a digital twin but there's there's lots of potential choices here so on to some results so so this is um this is what the water level output predictions or emulations look like I shouldn't say predictions so this is trying to emulate the water level across this uh, 4,000 seconds of time. What we're showing here is the in blue is the quantity of interest. So that's actually data from the from the Liège team from the from measured data from the tank. We've got two model outputs. So PBM is physics based model. Okay, so this this sort of orange orange slightly red color that's the ABC um, prediction of the um, the model, the ODE model, the, the ordinary differential equation model. And then this sort of more like sandy yellowy color, that's the database model, the NARCS model. And it's pretty obvious that the, the NARCS model is much better than uh, the physics based model here, which is what we expect. And then we've combined those into a digital twin output function, which which essentially it chooses either completely chooses the, the, the uh, database model because it's so good or it very heavily weights it. So it, it, it only weights the physics based model a very uh, small amount. There's a, I know I said X1 is greater than 10, but that, that also links to X2 being 10. So when, when we get to 10, we start to get overflow effects here. So some of the dynamics become a little bit more complicated here and here. This is, this is when the tanks are overflowing. Can do the same for Another choice of models. So here we've chosen the, the the less sophisticated physics model. Okay, so this is M1 rather than M2. Run the same thing again, and just showing what the two model outputs do, we get something similar. Okay, maybe a slightly less good matching for both the physics and and the database model, but the database model is still very very good here. It captures very closely the 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 QOI. So kind of um, moving to some conclusions. So what we've tried to show is we've, we've we've thought about this time evolving digital twin concept. We've tried to apply it to an engineering example. Um, the digital twin was some model combination using weights. Um, we're taking the responses of each of the models and then using a, a, a sort of minimization of the, the normalized mean square error. But as I said, as I was going through these, these were our sort of you know first choices to make things easy, uh, simple as possible. And more sophisticated things could be done and then we then we segment the data we repeat this process segment by segment okay so we, we're re repeatedly sort of recalibrating um, using sequential segments of data measured from the physical twin so we're, we're continually updating our, our emulation and then we, we saw it applied to this cascaded tank system i mean the, the system had some non-linearities in it so it wasn't an entirely trivial system 
but we did have the advantage of having um, closed form differential equation type models um, where, where probably on a uh, bigger, more complicated engineering digital twin, we wouldn't have those. Okay, so that's why we use the ABC. And then, if you, of course, in future work, we'd like to move on to, you know, move to these more complicated ideas of simulation and prediction. Thanks again to the co-authors and, and we got some funding from EPSRC, so, um, uh, you know, we need to acknowledge uh, their help as well. So thanks for your attention. Um, Jacob, I'll hand back to you. Thank you so much, David, uh, for a very nice presentation. And uh, I think we can start the discussion now. So whoever wants to ask questions, just uh, switch on your mic or raise your hand. And I try to navigate this. I have a couple of questions, but... Uh, maybe I can go first. Saurabh, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, thanks, David. Thanks for the nice presentation. Um, I have two questions. Uh, first of all, this idea of combining the physics-based model and data-based model uh, kind of immediately makes me think of uh, something like Kalman filtering. Have you thought in that direction or can you give a little bit comparison uh, if you have already thought about it? And second thing, I want to know about the scalability of your approach because I mean, if you increase your model library uh, ensemble methods, you need to train every database model separately. And and if the size of the problem grows, that can have issues. So can you comment on this? Yeah, they're both good points. So the common filtering is interesting. And we have we have thought about it. I'm, I'm not a real expert in common filtering, but you know, we tend to think about, as I understand it, common filtering in terms of time step by time step predictions for whatever, whether it's parameters or, or whatever um, we we're and and we're trying to do you know these slightly longer um, segments of data so if we think about the time evolution I think in a digital twin I think you would probably be trying to operate over multiple time scales so I think you would want to build in some time step by time step predictors and then I think you would have some uh, other length scales of predictions the one we showed was relatively Short scale, you know, 128 points or, you know, hundreds of thousands of points. Mm -hmm. And then I think you'd be looking at time scales of, uh, again, you know, beyond that as well, much longer time scales. And and the idea would be that in, on each time scale, you can extract some useful, useful information from the data, which you can then feed back to the user of the, of the digital twin, essentially. So can I say something, David? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sarah, that, that's a very good point. I think uh, Eleni Hadzi and uh, her group and 88 and Vasilis have done some amazing work on grey box models using uh, Kalman filters and Gaussian processes. So that is definitely something uh, you can do. You can do. You can do um, uh, as well. And they have some amazing work on on that. So. It's definitely something. Obviously, you can implement your physics inside your uh, um, uh, on either the kernel of the Gaussian processes or either the states uh, of uh, of the Kalman filter or an unsended Kalman filter, whatever you want uh, to use there or a particle filter, yeah. which is not very difficult because ABC can can has can have SMC there to do the parameter estimation as well, so a sequential uh, way. So. This is definitely something uh, you can do very, very successfully. And there are groups like Alenis that they have done uh, great, great work on that. Yeah, because it will also enable the nonlinear weighting. I mean, because what you're doing is kind of just a linear weighted sum of two models. And with the answer. Yeah, I, yeah, I think the advantage of the ABC there is if you have multiple models, it can just jump around models and select uh, the best model uh, um, uh, at the end. And it has the advantage of uh, not needing a closed form from the likelihood. Mm -hmm. So that is one of the good things of ABC. It's ridiculously slow sometimes. That's mm -hmm. why if you want to do parameter estimation at the same time, uh, mm -hmm. You can use SMC or nested sampling uh, to to make that uh, quicker. So definitely, these are all solutions uh, you can you can come forward. Uh, I, I I I agree with you. Okay, thank you. And uh, scalability point. Yes, yeah, so scalability. I mean, we we've used a very like we we are doing everything on a small scale, right? So we we've got just a couple of models. Yeah. If your model library started to become quite big you know you'd have to use some more sophisticated model selection i think wouldn't you you'd have to pre-select i think probably 
it depended on the computer computational resource you had and and again on the context of what you were trying to achieve but i think you would probably have to pre-select before using models to make predictions i i guess and or some other more sophisticated model selection okay thank you all right i can see oh i, th I thought that uh, somebody wants to ask a question uh, I I have one question uh, related to um, the uh, uniqueness of model selection, or maybe the fact that on on your results uh, one and two, um, your uh, database model looked uh, performing super well compa as comparing to the physics based model that you chose. And my question is why at all the framework would uh, choose um, in any fraction the physics-based model and uh, how, how does it work in practice, this model selection? If, if it is an averaging, then probably at some point uh, it would be quite likely to choose the best model, the, the most fitting one, not to average all of them in some fraction. and. and how how does it work here? So this is my first question. Maybe I will stop now. Yeah. So the you're right. If you're just trying to fit to the, then the obvious thing to do is just choose the best model, right, and and not choose any fraction from the other model. The reason, one of the reasons, one of the motivations we had for including the physics-based model. I mean, there's a couple, but one of the, one of them was that we were interested in the potential for prediction. And and of course the the you know the physics based model has um, a predictive capability that often the database model won't have outside the context of the data that you're using to train it, essentially. So we were so we were really interested in that. What we ended up doing is essentially choosing to look at emulation as our as our primary our first kind of step, and that nearly always wants to weight the database model most heavily. And in fact, it does choose. Um, to zero weight the physics based model in some of these segments. Um, I mean, Nikos, I don't know whether you want to comment. I think nearly all of the segments in some of these cases were were zero weighted for the physics based model. Is that right? I, I think I think I think we don't do sometimes we don't do justice on the physics based models and um, the physics based model is not bad here. I think there were some um, with all physics, there were some things that they were missing in the physics model uh, there. So if you add some extra uh, physics that you can find that they're needed, it can get even better. But I think it's extrapolation, the big thing that you need to include in the physics-based model, because we know that any machine learning algorithm is as good as the data you give and the representations you give. And I think there is a big, big um, motivation now in the engineering community, but I would say the machine learning community as well, to include as much physics or as much knowledge you have within that so you can increase the extrapolation and you can do a good bias correction because sometimes we use physics based models and they're really really uh, important when you want to extrapolate beyond what you see from the data so i think that was the motivation and if 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 we see the literature either from from uh, people like um Eleni or uh, here in Sheffield from Lizzie Cross or other or Matthias Feyas, we can see that uh, on more complicated um, uh, problems, uh, incorporating the physics is really critical to get this uh, bias correction capability uh, 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 at the end. Uh, the update of your model is, is really critical. But you're right, here is not evident um, so much what is the power of that, but I think I really believe we should look at incorporating as much physics as we can as engineers in that machine learning um, uh, model. But you, you're correct, it just zeroes this, the thing. It's a very cruel way here. I think these weights potentially you can make them better as, with an optimization algorithm where you, you, you check what are the optimal weights to give you the best extrapolation point potentially. Um, on the simulation error, but uh, I, I think I think that was the motivation of including um, this weighting between the two of them. Um, but it's a simplistic way that happened here from from Lara. Obviously, you can make it uh, much more complicated. 
Maybe. Because this somehow links, thanks for your answer, this somehow links to my second question that uh, perhaps at some point you are thinking about predictive capabilities of the system. You don't only want to fit uh, your outputs uh, the best possible over time and uh, update your fitting, but you are always interested to somehow monitor the system and then uh, to take some interaction with the system in case it is needed. Um, so maybe there could be some ways to do that, some sort of better weighting, uh, let's say, to also uh, take into account when constructing your loss function, for instance, the predictive capabilities of, of your model, let's say the physics-based versus the uh, data-based. Then you can see how predictive they are if you get new data. And uh, based on that criterion, you can adjust your weights towards one or the second one. Yeah. Uh, uh, one, uh, one of them is better at uh, fitting the data and the other one is better at maybe predicting uh, future. Yeah, I think there are two nice ways to do that. Either you can correct the residual error, the bias error that you get from the physics with the database model, or either you can incorporate all that stuff inside your predictive capability of the machine learning, like constraint a neural network or a Gaussian process or a Kalman filter with your physics. Uh, and I think there are two nice ways of doing exactly what, what, what you're saying here, or mm -hmm. either you can optimize these weights as a different way of doing it. Because that's essentially bias correction, what's happening. What it would do there, if none of these weights were perfect, it would try it would try to balance the error you would get from the database or vice versa from the physics-based uh, model. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a question in the chat. Um, from Hitchin. Yes. Uh, how, how, okay, Hitchin. Yes. Uh, thank you so much for this uh, great presentation. By the way, I understand that uh, digital twin concept it is very used like um, uh, to make prediction uh, because it's very heavy, expensive to make um, some change in real world. So we can make simulation or uh, prediction and real uh, and virtual environment. So I'm thinking um, how to predict the effect of external shock, let's say damage of tank, of the tank, and the behavior of the system. Uh, how you can see that? Because it's, it has a big potential. I see this kind of research. Thank you. When you say ex external shock, you mean uh, some su sudden impulse to the chain, you know, in, inside the inside the tank system. Yeah, and you can you can imagine because this kind of work it has big implication on industry, uh, and flood in in Belgium or something like that. So maybe you can uh, think uh, we can think about like uh, external shock. It could be uh, uh, a fire or or uh, or earthquake or or damage in the tank and the system and physical system, and see how the how this system overall behave. That could be, I think, possible to do with this digital twin framework. Isn't it? Yeah, I mean, that's, I think, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? There's, um, if you're trying to make predictions, um, that, that there's sort of several categories, isn't there? There's, you know, if we if we validated our model, or if we have a set of a regime of valid parameters, inputs and outputs, that we that we are relatively confident in and we've assessed the uncertainties um, and we've built a model physics-based model if we're trying to then look to sort of extreme cases like earthquake or other shocks or you know flood or you know uh, some kind of failure that's very difficult to do unless we have any data in if we don't have any data in that regime then we then we would really start to fall back on the physics base model predictions essentially wouldn't we i mean that's traditionally what what people have done um i think you're right that ideally in the digital twin world we would like to be able to make move towards those more more um, difficult prediction zones and the earthquake community have actually already done a lot of this by recording 
earthquake data and sharing them across the the, the, the earthquake research community. So they're a good example of a, of a community of researchers that have kind of used data for a long, long time, real recorded data to inform their, their models and inform their predictions. I'm not sure how much other data there is in terms of other things like flood or other shocks, fire and so on. Possibly, I don't know those areas, so po possibly there are also data sets that are available. But you're right, there's no, there's no reason why we can't try and apply this sort of methodology or digital twin methodology more generally into those, into those predictive areas. Thank you. It's clear. Thank you so much. All right. I can see that uh, Nicolas left a message that he needs to leave. Thanks, Nicolas. <clears throat> Right, and uh, about the rare events, because uh, earthquakes and others are quite rare, right? And yeah. doing statistics over you know, on this sort of uh, events is not that easy. So, but it is something that you already mentioned, that, that it is a part of the difficulty. That they are not very frequent, and you don't need to have data, and then perhaps you need to rely on more physics-based models uh, okay can you can you extend this uh, uh, let's say your comment on that how would you approach it say having database and physics based models how would you um, approach this problem having your framework yeah it's, it's an interesting point so i mean i, I think maybe maybe it's a little it's, it's worth giving a little bit more context because again we've done something relatively simple here and what we've you're know, coming back to what we said earlier is we just let the weighting uh, the kind of if you think about the you know the, the weighting choices as being some kind of optimization, we've we've just defined that, let it go, and and what it does is it chooses its bias towards choosing the database model in this in this case, right? When I talk to real engineer engineers in industry, they don't t tend to want to do that. What they want, what they've done generally is that they've invested hugely in the physics based modeling. So in engineering, most people have in invested a huge amount of effort and computational development in things like finite element and, you know, um, computational fluid dynamics simulations and so on. And so the way they see it is that they want to, you know, they want to keep their investment there and then they want to try and add on some database asset um, parts which can give them something extra you know it's, it's a bit like they've evolved their physics based models until they've sort of asymptote and they can't squeeze any more value out of those but they definitely don't want to want to throw throw that away so they see it as like an augment aug augmentation idea can they get some better predictions from their existing physics based models by augmentation with some database models in some way and i think the you know, going back to what you're saying about the rare scarcity of data or, or, or rare, you know, rare um, data that's hard to get hold of. I think, again, they they see it in, in those terms very often. So they're already very, very invested, a lot of engineers in physics based modeling. In fact, of course, I don't you know, maybe you've talked to some some of them are so invested in physics based modeling that they kind of they kind of believe in ultimate determinism. Right. So they they think if they just get enough, you know, uh, fidelity in their models, you know, if they have a complex enough mesh and a big enough computer, then they can actually solve everything deterministically. Okay, so that's like a sort of philosophical mindset, isn't it? Um, whereas I think for coming at it from an uncertainty analysis and data place point of view, we would say, well, that's, you know, that that's, that's, not, that's a very difficult philosophical uh, thing to kind of believe. Um, and of course, we could fall into the opposite trap and say that, well, there's a sort of opposite philosophical point where we believed if we had enough data and enough computational power that would solve everything right which is kind of the counterpoint um and i think digital twin we're trying to we're trying to optimize between those and, and get the best out of our out of our physics models and our data but yeah coming back to your point i think that the the engineering community often sees the data as as that additional augmentation to either get something additional out of their modeling or to validate and verify their existing physics based models. And I think that's how they see the more extreme type of case like, like the earthquake engineering. All right. I, 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 I thank you for your answer. Yeah. And I, I agree that it is not that uh, certain how to, how to I mean, attack this, this sort of problem. 
it, 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 I like. I mean, the phrase "physics informed machine learning" has been popular recently, right? And you know, it, the there isn't a phrase that's equivalent to, that's the opposite. But uh, it would be, you know, data informed physics based modeling is, and that's what most engineers are trying to do in in industry, right? They've been, and for many years, they've been doing that. But the data has been, even benign data has been scarce to some extent up until very recently, and now we have a, now we have the technology through sensor networks and and data acquisitions to gather large amounts of data in it relatively easily but but as you as you pointed out most of it is very benign operational conditions isn't it so we can we can gather huge amounts of data but it's really quite boring because it's just if it's a wind turbine it's just 99.999 percent of it is is just the wind turbines going around in relatively benign conditions right so once we've gathered enough of that data we can throw the rest of it away because it's it, we can't extract anything interesting what we want is the 0.01 percent where there's a huge storm that only happens once in four or five hundred years. Um, and that's much more valuable data to us, essentially, isn't it? Because then we can use that to try and understand what happens in those more extreme cases. True. Right. Um, I think there is no one who wants to ask a question. So let me thank you again, David. Uh, for a very nice presentation and uh, discussion. Um, uh, thank you all for, for coming here and for, for, for your attention and discussion. And I will keep you posted about future seminars. One of those should, should be next, next week. So you will get notified. And uh, yeah, have a, look, have a good day. Everybody. Thanks everyone. Thanks very much, Jacob. Thanks everybody. It's been a pleasure to to have a chat with you.